good morning dear students once again i welcome you all for my lecture uh, this is the second lecture on materials and material characterization in my previous lecture i explained you in detail about nano materials and nano technology and the role of nano technology applications of nano materials and uh, different methods of synthesizing nano materials and also little bit about nano composites and their implication on the present uh, society now uh, it is time to proceed with uh, material characterization this is the second part of the syllabus that is module 5 uh, of engineering physics in material characterization we have to discuss in brief very brief about different instruments their uh, principal working construction working and applications very little about uh, few instruments first of all what is uh, characterization let us uh, try to understand this particular uh, term first when you synthesize a material a detailed investigation of its structure composition and properties are required this detailed study is known as characterization see whenever you manufacture whenever you produce a material or a substance or a device or anything it must be tested first it must be uh, analyzed first for example i design this pen when i fabricate this pen i have to investigate few things number 1 how smoothly it is writing under what temperature it can uh, work or up to what temperature it can work or whether it withstands certain pressure what is the surface structure what type of uh, you know color ink i used whether that ink sustain uh, other uh, external parameters all these things i have to study it is not material testing it is not material testing material testing is slightly different before you proceed to the material testing you need to have certain uh, parameters details okay for example when you design a glass plate okay what is the surface evenness or unevenness of that glass plate is there any rough portion on the glass surface is there any you know scratch on the glass surface and what about the optical property whether optical property is uniform everywhere all those things we need to study similarly when i design a copper wire whether uh, the resistivity or resistance all are within the required limit or not okay and whether that material has the required tensile strength or uh, you know mechanical strength or not all those things i need to know okay and uh, if i synthesize some new compound what are all the functional groups present in the compound how they are arranged okay what is the bond length what is the bond angle bond strength all these things i need to know so this is what is called as characterizational studies so when a compound or a material or a substance or a uh, you know instrument or device anything is designed or synthesized fabricated it must be investigated thoroughly that investigation includes mechanical property studies thermal property studies chemical property studies optical property studies and many more so it includes both physical properties and chemical property study this study i can call as material characterization so material characterization therefore includes topography that means the surface morphology and crystallography crystallography means structural study okay and not only crystallography even topography also morphology also they all belongs to structural studies next detection of nature of elements compounds their concentration and position of the functional group that's what i told you just now this is what is called as compositional study analysis of thermal electrical optical mechanical and other properties this is nothing but property study so when it comes to characterization it includes structural study composition study as well as property study so all put together i can call it as a characterization so for this characterization i need instrument for material property study whether it is a property study morphology study or composition study i need some instruments okay like for example you pass light through the prism and the light splits into seven colors i want to see the wavelength of each and every color for that i need instrument and the instrument used is nothing but spectrometer okay that you might have studied or used in puc for dispersive power calculation 
or you might have used in uh, PUC for wavelength calculation using diffraction grating. Okay, so for any characterizational study, we need instruments. So different techniques are used, different instruments are used in uh, material characterization. Well, these are some of the commonly used instruments. They are XRD means X-ray diffractometer, XPS, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy or spectrometer, EM means electron microscopy means microscope. Microscopy is a technique, microscope is a instrument. Transmission electron microscope that is TEM, scanning electron microscope that is SEM or scanning tunneling electron microscope is STEM. And finally, AFM, Atomic Force Microscope. See, these are all the instruments used for characterizational studies. Some of them are used for physical property study. Some of them are for chemical property study. And the list is not ending here. There are many more techniques. For example, FTIR is there. NMR is there. Okay, so there are many. Even nowadays, we are using what is called squid. Right? There are many many instruments and many many uh, you know techniques are available for characterization and in this uh, uh, tutorial and even in the next tutorial or next lecture we just focus on principle construction working and very few applications of these instruments this is a very brief study this is a very brief study that way each and every instrument itself takes uh, hours of hours lecture requires a lot of uh, time for the detailed understanding so because of the shortage of time and because of the syllabus constraint i limit myself only to the principal construction and application of the instruments and wherever required i go little bit beyond the syllabus also if it is required and if time permits I will do even that also. Well, with this, uh, dear students, let us now take up the X-ray diffractometer, the first instrument in the list. Short form, it is XRD. Here onwards, I sometimes call it as XRD. Sometimes I pronounce the full name, X-ray diffractometer. So both are same. First of all, we should have a basic knowledge of diffraction. See, when light falls on the opaque object, it deviates from the path. Instead of going in a straight line, it deviates from the path. This is known as bending of light or diffraction of light. This you might have studied in POC. Diffraction is a bending phenomenon. Actually, light bends even when it goes from one medium to another medium also. That is refraction. That is due to change in the refractive index. But here, there is no change in the medium. Earlier also it was in air. Afterwards also it is in air. Only thing when it encounters the sharp edge, it deviates from the initial path. So bending of light as it passes around edges of the object and hence encroachment of the shadow. That is very important. See, this is an object. When light falls, this side there will be shadow. But when light bends snow, light will go into the shadow region. So some of the shadow region is encroached by the light. That is the reason why all shadows are not sharp. Please try to watch the shadow, shadow of sheet of paper, shadow of pin or even your shadow itself. Check edges are not very sharp. There will be small amount of blurness. That is because of diffraction. Next, the amount of bending means how much it deviates. It all depends on size of the object. This is very basic thing. You studied this in PUC. Please try to recall. This is one of the most important requirement for bending of light. Light bends only when the object is uh, very, very small in size. So size of the object comparable to size of the wavelength. And you know, visible light is very small, 10 to the power of minus 9 meter, minus 10 meter. So therefore object thickness also must be as much small as possible. For example, rainbows colors produced on CD. Rainbow colors produced on CD. So, see here, the rainbow colors produced on CD, it's all because of diffraction. Because on the CD, we have track. And each track is something like a scratch. And when light falls on the scratch, it deviates. So, bending takes place. 
holograms holograms available on the book or uh, even in the food product box or uh, some mobile phones you have the hologram sticker there you see holo uh, you know beautiful rainbow colors silver lining sometimes found around the edges of the cloud corona surrounding the sun or moon like this so this is silver lining on uh, you know around the cloud rainbow color on the cd and this is a silver you know corona means the circle around the moon or sun these are all due to diffraction of light so this is diffraction phenomena coming to x rays you all know x ray is nothing but electromagnetic wave it is part of the electromagnetic spectrum just now i said bending of light wave depends on size of the object visible light is about 10 power minus 9 to minus 10 right but x ray when it comes to x ray it is very very small much much smaller than the visible light visible light is about 500 to 600 into 10 to the power of minus 9 at the 5000 into 10 power minus 10 x ray it is about 0.1 into 10 power minus 10 so where is 5000 where is 0.1 so if uh, visible light if you treat this as if this much big x ray is only this much okay so x rays are very 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 small in size you cannot bend them using traditional objects like pin edges of the shaving blade scratches on the cd okay all are okay for visible light all of them are okay for visible light but not okay for x-ray so x-rays cannot be diffracted so easily because of the size factor this is what i mentioned here if size of the slit or size of the object is comparable to wavelength of the incident light diffraction occurs no doubt when it comes to x-ray the story is not same their wavelength is about 0.1 nanometer and therefore they cannot be diffracted so easily. Dear yeah, students, one thing I tell you, sound waves are very big in size. They can be easily diffracted. They bend across the corners of the wall. Therefore, you can hear if a person who is talking outside, you cannot see him, but he can receive his voice. One of your friend is outside the room, he is talking. You can listen to, you can, you can receive his voice, but you cannot see him. So, sound waves are big, they can bend easily. Light waves are small, therefore they cannot bend so easily. And in light waves, once again, you have that what is called electromagnetic spectrum. So, from gamma ray, wavelength increases. Shortest is gamma ray. Next, little bit okay is X-ray. Next, UV. Next, visible. So, this way, wavelength increases. So, bending phenomena is negligible in gamma, X-ray, UV. Visible, okay. That way, if you go, radio waves bend too much because radio waves are very big in size. They can be easily diffracted. That is why communication is very simple. That's why for communication purpose, we use radio waves. Okay. They bend across the building. They bend across the wall. They bend across the mountain, hill, any obstacle. They bend so easily. So this is about bending. But when it comes to X-ray, it is impossible to bend them using traditional objects. But fortunately, it can be done with the help of crystals. Because in crystals, in crystals, there is a periodic arrangement of atoms, atom by atom. And spacing between two atoms is very, very small. It is in terms of 0.1 to 1 nanometer. The atomic spacing or lattice spacing, I hope you studied crystal structure in chemistry PUC. So, you have heard of this word lattice, lattice plane, crystal, etc. So, the spacing is comparable to wavelength of X-rays. Hence, it is possible to diffract X-rays using crystals. So, in fact, crystal acts like a 3D grating for X-rays. At this stage, I would like to mention one thing. Dear students, I hope you have used what is called diffraction grating in your physics lab for laser diffraction experiment. There is one thin glass plate. It consists of lines drawn using diamond. Between two lines, there is some spacing. The two lines and the spacing, that spacing acts like a slit. This is a line, this is a line, this is slit. So when light falls on the slit, it deviates. That gap is big enough, okay, small enough to bend a uh, laser beam. So it is acting like a grating. Grating is nothing but an arrangement of lines, that's all. It is something like a vertical mesh vertical mesh 
in normal mesh you no know, chicken uh, mesh it is like this so you have horizontal and vertical here it is only vertical lines the gap between each line is a slit so when light falls on the slit it deviates that is for laser and the whole arrangement is grating when it comes to x ray atoms are arranged such a way that the gap between two atoms acts like a slit so that's why i said in that last sentence the whole arrangement of atoms x axis y axis z axis whole arrangement of atoms behaves like three dimensional grating for x rays so when light sorry when x ray falls on the atomic arrangement it deviates very easily a device which is working on this principle what is that principle diffraction of light but of course it is not like diffraction of x rays diffraction means bending for bending an obstacle is required for normal light obstacle is normal like it just the shaving blade scratches on the glass diffraction grating a thin wire hair etc but for x ray objects are not like that object bending object is nothing but crystal plane crystal lattice atoms are acting like obstacles for x ray so this phenomena this property is used in the designing of x ray diffractometer so therefore i say a device used and to analyze the crystal structure using x ray diffraction is known as x ray diffractometer in fact with the help of bending of x rays we can easily study arrangement of atoms nature of atoms environment around the atom gap between the atoms defects in the crystal means impurity is present in the material so many details we can study so many details we can extract from x ray diffractometer so this way we use x ray diffractometer for analyzing for characterization well i hope you all are following let us proceed further further first a brief explanation of x ray x ray as you all know is a second highest energetic radiation they have wavelength in the range of 10 nanometer to 0.01 nanometer that is the lowest one and they were discovered in 1895 by william rontgen next crystal again a very brief explanation of crystal crystal consists of atoms arranged in a particular pattern that repeats periodically in the three dimension suppose if they are arranged like this x axis y axis z axis that will be repeated that will be repeated okay so three dimensional repetition periodic repetition i think you studied this in chemistry if the periodicity exist it is crystal if there is no periodicity it is amorphous look at this illustration in the first diagram that is mentioned as crystal line atoms are arranged in a regular fashion whereas in amorphous you can see some irregularity atoms are not so perfectly arranged not perfectly arranged some haphazard order you can notice okay <coughs> so x ray and then crystal more about crystal unit cell is the smallest building block of any crystal dear students actually we were teaching the whole of crystallography in the previous syllabus but now they have removed so without the knowledge of crystal it is very difficult to proceed therefore i am giving a brief explanation of crystal so in any crystal you have the smallest division smallest division which is called as unit cell and these unit cell or cells are arranged in a three dimension x axis y axis and z axis so unit cells are getting repeated they are getting repeated like how a unit cell looks this is uh, this is uh, shaded area is unit cell this is uh, shaded area is unit cell okay and each corner is occupied by one dot okay this is nothing but lattice point this dot may be an atom may be an ion may be a molecule also so in total we call it as lattice point in total we call it as lattice point and such type of unit cells are arranged along x axis along y axis sorry along x axis along y axis along z axis so x axis y axis z axis minus z axis as well as minus uh, sorry plus z axis minus y as well as plus y plus x as well as minus x so we have an arrangement next 
uh, okay I skip this part this is the classification this is the very first classification basic classification of crystals that way there are many classifications we divide them into systems seven systems 14 classes 32 groups like that simplest one among them is each corner is occupied by one lattice point that is SCC simple cubing apart from that if you have one more at the center it is called BCC body center in addition to corner if you have one atom or one lattice point at the center of the face it is FCC I skip assuming that you know all these and studied these things in chemistry second PUC well I have a given a brief knowledge of brief introduction brief explanation of crystals and brief about x-rays now let us move on to one of the important law that is Bragg's law crystal structure to analyze the crystal structure using x-ray diffraction Bragg's law is essential Bragg's law atoms in crystal may be thought of as set of planes I told you know atoms are arranged each line okay each line along x and y considered as a plane so this is one plane next this is another plane so these are the planes plane by plane plane by plane they are arranged like this okay set of planes a monochromatic x-ray means single wavelength x-ray beam falling on these planes gets diffracted after the diffraction see x-rays they come fall on the surface and they go like this the diffracted rays mix together means they interfere together remember diffraction is associated with the interference diffraction is followed by interference that means after the bending mixing takes place after the diffraction the diffracted rays they combine together thereby they produce intensity depending on whether they interfere constructively or destructively we get some interference pattern on the screen this is the general tendency I hope you studied diffraction of visible light in PUC so constructive interference takes place or destructive interference takes place depending upon the path difference of the diffracted rays our Bragg's law gives a relation between lattice spacing the plane to plane spacing angle of diffraction and then and then what is called wavelength of the x-ray used here is the diffraction sorry Bragg's law explanation so these are the lattice planes these are the lattice planes the gray color dots are lattice points and x-ray beam monochromatic beam from the source falls on the plane diffracts falls on the plane diffracts okay after the diffraction so these are the diffracted beams they interfere and between these two between these two this ray and this ray I have this much of path difference this is the path difference if I take the spacing between the planes as a D I can show that path difference is a D sin theta anyway the proof and all those things are uh, you know skipped not included directly I write path difference as 2d sin theta and you know if the path difference is equal to n lambda it leads to constructive interference to n plus 1 lambda by 2 it leads to destructive interference so here I take 2d sin theta is equal to n lambda where n is the integer d is the lattice spacing theta is the glancing angle d is the lattice spacing that can be calculated lambda if you know wavelength of the x-ray d can be calculated so plane to plane distance can be calculated this is Bragg's law see dear students you might be confused sir whether they ask x-ray whether they ask Bragg's law whether they ask uh, you know crystals what actually I have to concentrate you have to concentrate on x-ray diffractometer that's all that is principal construction working but before uh, knowing Bragg's law without knowing crystal without knowing diffraction okay if you directly go to x-ray diffractometer it may lead to confusion that is why I gave some brief introduction okay so Bragg's law explanation I gave a crystal explanation I gave diffraction also I gave now I move on to x-ray diffractometer so x-ray diffractometer is a device used to analyze the crystal structure 
using X-ray diffraction. XRD phenomena is a very important. You see, XRD phenomena is very important for crystal structure analysis. So, XRD is a device working on the principle of diffraction of X-rays. So, this is the principle. Coming to construction part. Yes, you need to have source of X-ray. That is the essential part. You need to place the specimen on a stand. That is another part. You need a detector. That is another part. So, source, stand, detector. Like uh, in spectrometer, you have a prism. You have light coming from the collimator. Light going towards the telescope or eyepiece. So, these are the very essential things. From the source, light comes, falls on the prism. After the dispersion, it proceeds towards the eyepiece. Okay. Almost, almost same arrangement even in the uh, XRD also. So, it goes like this. XRD consists of three basic elements. X-ray tube, sample holder, detector. X-ray tube means source, sample holder and detector means telescope. Something like that. Monochromatic X-rays generated in a cathode ray tube and are collimated and directed onto the sample. So, X-rays produced from the instrument are collimated. If they are spread over a wide angle, they must be collimated. Means you have to make them narrow and then make them to proceed towards the sample. X-ray beam uh, falling on the plane of the crystal is diffracted in all the directions. So, X-ray came, diffracted and proceed in all the direction. So, X-ray came, fell on the subject, sorry, well, fell on the object and diffracted in all the directions. And now it is proceeding towards the detector. Here, what is detector? Detector is not something like eyepiece or a screen. It is an ionization chamber. In the chamber, we have easily ionizable gas. When energetic radiation enters the chamber, that gas gets ionized, ions are produced and those ions flow. When the ions flow, current is produced. So, that is called ionization current. Ionization current depends upon intensity of the radiation which is entering the chamber, depends upon amount of the radiation entering the chamber, nature of the radiation entering the chamber. So, by measuring the ionization current, you can know more about the radiation entering the chamber. So, ionization chamber is a detector actually. Well, the sample and the detector are so arranged that whenever the crystal rotates through an angle theta, the detector rotates through an angle 2 theta. See, the crystal is rotated through theta. The detector which is here, it has to rotate through 2 theta. This is a task for you. This is a small assignment for you. Why you have to rotate the detector through 2 theta? Please try to know. I am rotating the object like this, okay? This is my this is my crystal, this is my crystal, I allowed x-ray to fall on this and going like this. Now I rotate this one little bit through let us say 10 degree. The ray is now going through 20 degree. That is why I have to move through 2 theta. I give you a small task, why it has to go, why it is going through 2 theta, please prove this, it is possible. When, it, when, the, when the diffracting surface moves through an angle theta, deflected ray goes through an angle of 2 theta. Try to know more about this. Well, thus a deviated beam enters the detector, produces ionization current. So, that ionization current is recorded and a graph of ionization current for different angles is plotted. So, you rotate it through theta, theta, theta like this. Measure the corresponding current I and design a graph like this. Well, this is the instrument. Here is the source, here is the sample holder, here is the detector, that's all. The sample holder is rotated, detector is also rotated, but not the source. Source cannot be rotated. Well, this is the graph obtained I versus 2 theta, I versus 2 theta. Theta is the angle of rotation of the substance, 2 theta is the angle of rotation of the detector. You can see some peaks here. P1, P2, P3. For specific theta values, current is becoming maximum. And certainly it is because of constructive interference. More current enters into the chamber 
sorry, more radiation enters in the chamber, more ionization is produced, therefore more current. When the more radiation enters, only when the rays interfere constructively, means intensity is more. So when intensity is more, ionization is also more. So therefore I said, all these peaks corresponds to constructive interference. Well, from the peak we measure theta, from the theta and also by using this equation, by using this equation, very important parameter D that is called lattice spacing can be evaluated. Lattice spacing can be evaluated. So, I explained you how on X-ray diffractometer is constructed, how it works and what parameter we measure. I am not explaining how we measure, how we calculate D. Actually, they should have introduced this in detail. But you know, time is very limit. Okay, this module is only for 8 hours. Therefore, we are not going in detail about who exactly D is measured from these equations. Right, from these equations. I would have done some numericals on this particular D. If time permits, I will do it later on. Anyway, now you know construction, working, application and of course principle of XRD. I repeat, XRD is working on the principle of diffraction of X-rays and the X-rays are diffracted by lattice planes in crystal. XRD consists of source, sample holder, detector that is ionization chamber. They are arranged as shown in figure. And XRD is used to detect <coughs> D that is lattice spacing and it is done with the help of Bragg's law. That's all. Now, little bit about crystallite. Crystallite and then Scherer equation. Crystallite. When unit cell is repeated in three dimension, it generates the crystal. That's what I told you. Along X axis, along Y axis, along Z axis, you arrange the boxes. It generates a crystal. That whole structure is crystallite. If the crystallites are in single pattern, okay, arrange boxes like this only, like this only, like this only, only one type of box I put, only one type of box I put, then it is monocrystalline. Instead of that, I put one kind of box first, let us say blue color box, red color box, again blue color box, red color box, like that I put. Then it is polycrystalline. If there is no that uh, long type of arrangement, Okay, I put 3-4 box, then I deviate. Okay, haphazard, zigzag. Then it is amorphous. That I already told you. So, if there is long range orderness, it is crystallite. If all the unit cells are alike, it is mono. If they are of multiple type, it is poly. If there is no long range arrangement, it is amorphous. Crystallites, okay, this is a crystal. This is a crystallite. I have another crystallite, right? They combine. And whole thing is nothing but grain. Okay, see up to this area I arrangement. Up to this area I arrangement. I combine them both. Then it is, see for example my fingers. My fingers are arranged in a particular fashion. These fingers are also arranged in a particular fashion. Okay, now I arrange them like this. Or I arrange them like this. Right, I, 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 or I arrange them like this. Right, so this is a crystallite. This is a crystallite. I arrange them in a particular fashion. The border where they uh, are arranged is nothing but grain boundary. This whole arrangement is grain. This is a crystallite. Say for example, well, uh, so this is one, one regular arrangement, right? This is another regular arrangement. This is another regular arrangement. Well, I may arrange them like this. I may arrange them like this. Or I may arrange them like this, okay? I, I may arrange them like this or I may arrange them like this. Okay. So all these arrangements are finally going to give you whole structure which is grain. And the line between the two crystallites is called grain boundary. I repeat, crystallite is an arrangement. Amorphous is a randomness. Arrangement of crystallite further arranging them is grain. Line between two grains is grain boundary. And all these grains put together gives you the multi material whole particle like uh, sugar, salt, something like that. So whole thing is now particle. If you take one salt cube or one sugar cube, you have 
grain boundary is inside you have grains inside you have crystallites inside okay so particle is the biggest one like this next comes grain next comes crystallite next comes molecule next comes atom so atoms atoms join together molecule molecule arranged in unit cell unit cell arranged in particular fashion crystallite crystallites arranged in particular pattern grain grain arranged in a particular pattern gives you particle okay so bottom to top if you go first comes atom next molecule next crystallite next grain next particle from top you become particle next is grain next crystallite next molecule next atom i hope you are following this now this is like this monocrystalline polycrystalline amorphous i skip this part so this is the grain boundary look at this right look at these arrangements okay so each uh, lamina is a crystal each lamina is a crystal each lamina is a grain between two grains whatever the line you have no that is boundary that is grain boundary so crystal the whole thing is crystallite the whole thing is particle something like that you can tell and these uh, crystallites size can be determined with the help of an equation called scherer equation so you need not have to worry much about the crystallite grain boundary etc just remember only this much crystallite is nothing but an arrangement of unit cells crystallites arranged together produces grain line between two grains is called grain boundary with the help of scherer equation we can determine the size of all of them here is the scherer equation d equals k lambda by beta cos theta k is a proportionality constant it is called scherer constant it varies from 0.62 to 2.08 depending upon what type of crystal it is whether it is fcc or bcc or scc or hcc okay hexagonal there are many types in crystals but for simple cubic or any cubic structures k is approximated to 0.94 and lambda is the wavelength of the x ray used theta is the angle of diffraction of the bragg's angle beta what is this beta see when you plot i versus theta uh, this i already showed you in one of my previous diagram there it was only a small peak i elaborated that peak okay so take the half width of this peak let us say maximum intensity is 100 then you mark a point at 50 okay if this is 100 now you mark a point at 50 there you measure the width this is nothing but half sorry full wave half maximum full width half maximum not wave sorry my ah, full wave half maximum so you measure this width this width is beta this width is beta okay from the xrd you get the graph in xrd graph there are many peaks consider the intense among them and calculate the width of the peak at half maximum that is fwhm note down the angle correspond to that particular peak let us say if you take the first peak note down 2 theta for that peak from that you get the theta value so substitute beta theta lambda and k you get the grain size you get the crystalline size normally we will have two three four peaks it is better to measure size for each and every peak and then take the average so it is better to calculate the average d value for all the peaks calculate d value and take the average of all those so this is how we measure crystal size grain size using scherer equation so dear students today in this video i explained you only about x-ray diffractometer i explained in brief about x-rays and also about diffraction and then something about crystals and then construction and working of x-ray diffractometer and then scherer equation scherer equation is very useful equation very useful tool to find the size of the crystal see we are not only measuring the angle not only measuring the spacing of the lattice planes we can even measure the size of the crystal also this is one way of characterization only so characterization means measurement of many things so using x-ray diffractometer we measure lattice spacing and also crystalline size that's all for today please share your feedback 
I already mentioned my email address in my first video. So please share your feedback so that I can improvise in further uh, tutorials. Well, I will end this session. Thank you. Thanks for your patient hearing. In my third lecture, I continue with the remaining instruments. Thank you once again.